So we go on with our work. The topic that will be discussed in this first panel concerns uh, Italian past legislative drafts for a code of crimes under international law, criminal law and international law perspective. I must absolutely save time for the discussion and so I introduce directly for the input to the, to the debate as speaker, Professor Petrazzi, full professor of international law at the University of Milan. Professor Petrazzi. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Chantal Meloni and the organizers of this uh, uh, conference for inviting me to participate in this extremely interesting debate. It is also an emotion for me to be in person, to be speaking at a conference in person for the first time in two years. <laughs> and. Uh, um, Many things have already been uh, said uh, by uh, the previous uh, speaker, by uh, Chantal Meloni, by Professor Jesperger, by Professor Pocard, uh, in particular in relation to the, uh, to the situation of the Italian uh, legal system with regard to the Rome statute, to the fact that uh, the Rome statute has only been partially uh, implemented uh, in the Italian legislation uh, up till now with the law of 2012, but uh, in particular the situation of uh, uh, the implementation of uh, crimes has uh, not uh, been uh, undertaken. <clears throat> uh, we know that uh, various commissions were established uh, since the beginning of the year 2000s to make proposals for the implementation of the Rome uh, Statute and these proposals, such as those of the Commissione Conforti, provided both for the introduction of international crimes and for the procedural provisions which would enable cooperation between the Italian authorities and the International Criminal Court. Um, However, all the procedures uh, within Parliament, also the other com commissions and the other uh, drafts uh, which were introduced in, to, in Parliament uh, uh, led, to, uh, led to nothing uh, up, till, uh, up till today. Um, so we can say that uh, to speak about the current situation of the Italian legislation, we know that the uh, genocide has been, uh, the crime of genocide has been uh, in, introduced into the Italian legal system. We know that the situation of uh, uh, war crime, war crimes is a kind of a messy situation. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but I will just recall the, that the implementation of war crimes is incomplete and problematic under various uh, respects, and it has already been, uh, been mentioned before. And Italy has never implemented the crimes against humanity. Uh, obviously, uh, a good number of them would be punishable as ordinary crimes, but uh, some of the conducts regulated in the Rome uh, Statute are not uh, subjected to uh, criminalization in uh, uh, Italy. <clears throat> uh, so I'm going to go into a brief uh, analysis of the various uh, drafts, uh, draft uh, law proposals that have been uh, introduced in the uh, Italian uh, Parliament during uh, the first decade of the year uh, 2000s. <clears throat> Um, and the interesting aspect of these uh, drafts uh, is that they contain what is missing in the Italian law of 2012, 
which means uh, the uh, introduction into the Italian legal systems of the crimes included in the Rome Statute. As for the uh, choice of the method for adapting the Italian legal system to the international crimes included in the Rome uh, Statute, while the Conforti Commission foresaw the introduction of amendments to the existing legislation, the prevailing choice that we may find in the Kessler, Jovene, Pianetta, and Gozzi draft uh, laws uh, was in favor of a specific code for international crimes, which on one side would reformulate the definitions of the Rome Statute crimes and include some other general principles of international criminal law, while at the same time incorporating by reference rules and principles of uh, the penal code of the wartime military criminal code and peacetime military criminal code and, and other laws. The scope of the various drafts is, uh, however, different, as on one side, Pianetta, the Pianetta draft, was merely including uh, genocide and crimes against humanity while delegating, to, delegating the government to adopt legislative decrees <laughs> to modify and integrate <laughs> the existing rules relating to war crimes. On the other side, the Kessler, Joven, and Godzi drafts, which are in fact quite similar to each other, uh, included all three categories of genocide, uh, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. In my view, it has already been mentioned before, in my view, the choice of a special law or code dealing with international crimes, as also done by uh, other countries, including Germany, is commendable, commendable, as it allows to identify international crimes as special crimes. The issue was mentioned before by, by Professor Pocard. Uh, it is true that from the point of view of the International Criminal Court, we could be uh, we could be, uh, as we say, complying with the statute even with the ordinary crimes provisions, but uh, this would not be, in my view, uh, substantially in compliance with uh, international uh, criminal law as such and with uh, customary international criminal law. Uh, and with uh, various treaties to which, uh, 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 that are binding for, for Italy. So it is necessary to have a proper uh, characterization of international crimes to identify them as international crimes, so as crimes which are different from the uh, ordinary uh, crimes. Uh, even when the underlying acts are totally uh, coincident, but anyway, international crimes also always have some uh, specific elements. <clears throat> Another commendable choice of the drafts, in my view, is that of encompassing all international crimes, uh, leaving aside aggression in one single piece of legislation, underlining thereby the common characters they all possess. This also allows to identify certain principles, such as in terms of statute of limitations, command responsibility, superior orders, jurisdiction, which shall apply to all these crimes. We will come back to some of these uh, issues. Um, obviously, the necess necessary coordination shall be established with the common principles of ordinary criminal uh, law, but I leave to other experts to identify whether the best solution from this point of view would be to have a totally separate code or such as in the drafts we are examining or to insert, for example, a new title within the penal uh, code. <clears throat> I will not enter into the uh, specific issues concerning the, uh, each category of crimes, in particular 
war crimes, where a series of issues arise in relation to the necessary amendment to the wartime military criminal code, to the coordination between the new code and the uh, wartime uh, military code, uh, the peacetime military code, the identification of the competent courts to adjudicate over military personnel in time of armed conflict. I will not go into these uh, uh, issues. A further general issue concerns, however, how the separate court or law or title is drafted in terms of the definition of the crimes included, uh, taking into account that a specific rewording of the crimes is preferable, if not imposed, by the requirements of the principle of legality, as it was mentioned previously uh, this uh, morning. Um, one possible way, and uh, already Professor uh, Jesperger uh, introduced to these uh, aspects, one possible way consists in the mere reformulation in the Italian language of the definitions of the crimes that one finds in the Rome Statute, which is basically what happens in the drafts we are examining. I am referring to Kessler, Jovene, Pianetta, and Gozzi, which in fact are quite similar, I, I said it before, to each other, with the exception of the major divergence of Pianetta with regard to the war crimes, which are not included in that draft. Uh, these drafts basically repro reproduce the crimes listed in the Rome Statute according to the definitions contained therein with minor divergences from or integrations to, su to such uh, definitions. They all add a reference to the statute and to the elements of uh, uh, crimes adopted by the Assembly of States Parties in the article concerning the interpretation of the law Although these articles contain more general references to international criminal law and the case law of international tribunals, which would open the door to possible broader influxes in the interpretative uh, process, uh, if these influxes are not anyway granted by other rules of uh, uh, international or national law. Um, one has to note, however, that in relation to war crimes, in this draft. The rewording is done mostly by unifying within single provisions the crimes applicable in time of international and non-international armed conflict. Although the way in which this is done, such as by referring to persons protected by the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and their additional protocols may give rise to issues as the second additional protocol does not contain uh, in a formal uh, sense uh, a reference to protected uh, persons. I also add that the definition of non-international armed conflicts provided in the draft is not all encompassing as it refers to protracted armed conflicts between governmental forces and organized armed groups, thereby excluding conflicts only involving organized armed groups, which are also non-international armed conflicts. A debatable choice is then that of including into the drafts the crime of mercenary activities, thereby equated to the categories of international crimes which are uh, considered by the drafts. So the problem is not the criminalization of mercenary activity, the problem is the inclusion in these, into these drafts. Um, a different path from the one chosen by these drafts would have been the one, as mentioned by Professor Jesperger, the one followed by other countries, and in particular by the German law, which uh, reproduces the definitions of the Rome Statute, but in some cases broaden, broadens their applications where such broadening uh, has been considered more in conformity with international customary law or because of the policy uh, <laughs> intents of the German legislature. And uh, 
this is the way which was chosen by, of course, by the Cariplo uh, project. Um, I am biased because I participated, although in a very limited way, to the uh, drafting of the Cariplo project, but uh, I would uh, support the bold uh, attitude chosen by the Cariplo uh, project um, on one side to accept the results acquired by the Rome Statute. Uh, as Professor Pocar said before, you cannot but uh, encompass the whole crimes included in the Rome Statute into the national legislation. Even where the statute goes further than uh, goes farther than, than customary uh, international law, where a case might be, for example, the one concerning the crime of apartheid. Um, on the other side, um, to broaden some of the notions accepted in Rome, where they appear too limited with regards to customary law, or in cases in which and this is obviously a political choice. It appears desirable to support emerging trends in the evolution of uh, uh, customary law. Um, so, of course, the, 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 we, uh, there is much debate of uh, what is the status of customary law in relation to one or the other, or the other crime, but to uh, uh, allow the legislator to introduce uh, um, crimes corresponding to a tendency emerging uh, in the field of customary international law uh, solves the, the issue. And uh, we cannot consider that, uh, as already said by Professor Bocaro, broadening uh, the crimes would, uh, uh, would entail uh, a bad implementation of the Rome Statute. The bad implementation of the Rome Statute would only exist if the crimes included in the Rome Statute are not introduced in a correct way into the domestic legislation, but uh, you can have uh, uh, broader uh, crimes without in any way uh, having a bad uh, implementation. Um, the draft's uh, choice to provide for the non-applicability of uh, statutes of limitation in, the, in relation to the crimes is also absolutely commendable, uh, although not strictly imposed by international law or by the Rome Statute, which of course provides for uh, no statute of limitation uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, before the International Criminal uh, Court, but anyway, uh, if we want uh, a fight against impunity, the uh, non-recognition of statutes of limitation is essential for the uh, punishment, the um, prosecution and punishment of international crimes. Um, as for jurisdiction, and I come close to my conclusions, as for jurisdiction, the best uh, formulation in my view is that contained in Article 15.3 of the Godzi draft, according to which, in case the crime is committed abroad and does not concern Italian citizens, either as alleged authors or victims, the crime is punished according to the Italian law if criminal proceedings have not been initiated before the ICC or a state party respecting the principle of complementarity in accordance with the statutes, Article 17. Uh, on the contrary, the Pianetta's, I don't agree with the Pianetta's draft provision according to which the exercise of universal jurisdiction would be furthermore subject to the request of the Minister of Justice uh, because it would involve uh, the uh, introduction of the political sphere in the, uh, in the decision process, uh, but there may be maybe some other problems in uh, the Italian law related to that. I was discussing this before with <laughs> Professor Viganò. <laughs> um, uh, let me just recall that the provision of universal jurisdiction, at least in the form of conditional universal jurisdiction, 
coupled to the rule out dedere, out judicare, is required by international law in relation to part of the crimes included in the drafts. Uh, both uh, these uh, rules, uh, no statute of limitations and conditional universal jurisdiction coupled to out dedere, out judicare, are uh, included also in the draft articles on crimes against humanity adopted by the International Law Commission in 2019. To conclude, um, a bold step entailing a special law including a broad codification of international crimes would constitute, in my view, the best option. Under a realistic view, I shall, however, notice, and some mentions were done before, that in this country, the political will to undertake effective measures to fight international crimes seems to be lacking, as also demonstrating the, by the rather depressing story of the implementation of the crime of torture in our legal uh, system. And I look at my friend Antonio uh, Marchesi. <clears throat> Uh, therefore, I think that already the adoption of a draft which would merely incorporate international crimes into the Italian legal uh, system as defined in the Rome Statute, although not entirely satisfactory, would be in the present circumstances a welcome miracle. But we have, of course, to fight for uh, the best solutions and to try to push for them uh, for the future. Uh, thank you very much. I thank uh, Marco Pedrazzi for his precious uh, presentation, introducing the topic, and also for the perfect respect of the time. Uh, and so now it's time to give the floor uh, to these discussions. First uh, of all, Professor Alessandra Noni, Associate uh, Professor of International Law at the University of Ferrara. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much to the organizers, uh, Chantal Meloni and Florian Jesberg, for having put together such an interesting uh, program. We will be addressing almost all of the hot topics at stake. And since the program of this conference is so rich, uh, I will try to focus on structural issues rather than on the implementation of specific provisions of the statute, which will be, I, I, suggest, I, I guess, the object of other panels in this conference. I would like to propose a few thoughts on the nature of the international obligations that the different uh, legislative proposals we are analyzing in this panel aim at implementing. Um, according to the GOSI uh, proposal, the draft arises from the need to adapt our legal system to the provisions of the ICC statute. Is this really the case? Is there a need to adapt our legal system to the provisions of the statute, and in particular to the provisions of the statute that include the definition of the crimes under international law, the substantive provisions of the statute. As it has already been mentioned in the opening remarks, uh, the statute does not truly encompass an obligation to implement the crimes at the domestic level, not even an obligation to prosecute those crimes at the domestic level. Strictly speaking, there is no such obligation within the, uh, the statute. However, as both Chantal and uh, Florian highlighted in their um, introductive remarks, um, the statute builds upon the idea of an integrated international criminal justice system that is based upon the principle of complementarity. So this system works only if states do their part for the prosecution of international crimes. So there might not be uh, an international fully-fledged obligation stemming from the statute to implement the crimes at the domestic level, but still I think there is a need to do it, and a need to do it properly. On the other hand, 
as it has already been mentioned, and as the preamble of the statute also recalls, the statute is not the only possible source of international obligations in this field. All states, including those that have not ratified the statute, have a duty under customary international law to exercise their criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes. This might perhaps not apply to all the crimes listed in the statute, but it does apply to most of them, at least when the crime is perpetrated on the territory of the state. Italy is also a party to many international criminal law conventions. I'm thinking, for instance, about the International Convention on Enforced Disappearance or the International Convention on Torture or the um, Palermo Protocol on Trafficking in Human Beings. And all these conventions include an obligation to criminalize those conducts. Wherever the obligation to criminalize heinous violations of human rights stem also from the duty to ensure respect for human rights that is provided under many human rights conventions. So in a way, the implementation of the ICC statute is an opportunity to fulfill international obligations that bind our country regardless of the statute. The existence of such obligations, such other obligations, should always be borne in mind when we interpret the domestic rules that will be enacted uh, to implement the statute, and this in order to avoid fragmentation. In this respect, I am particularly fond on, of the rule on interpretation as drafted in Article 5 of the Pianetta project, whereby when interpreting the rules included in the law, the judge should always take into due consideration the need to ensure the coherent application of international law, with special reference to international criminal law, the principles and rules of the statute, the elements of crime, and the judgments of international criminal courts. Now, the reference to international criminal law as such is perhaps a bit generic, but still, it clearly points at rules of international criminal law other than those included in the statute. And this is why I prefer this formulation to the ones included, for instance, in the Godzi, Jovene, and Kessler drafts that refer only to the statute and to the elements of crimes. Another aspect that should not be underestimated has to do with the nature of the uh, international obligations that we are attempting to implement and of the place that these obligations occupy within our domestic legal system. Insofar as the international criminal law provisions are provided under customary international law, Article 10 of the Italian Constitution applies the Italian legal system conforms to the generally recognized rules of international law. Now, Article 10, as we know, operates as a sort of permanent transformer, as Perasi used to say, automatically transforming international customary rules into domestic ones as soon as they emerge, they come into existence at the international level. Article 10, however, is not always sufficient to ensure the full implementation of the international rule, as it cannot by itself transform an international rule that is non-self-executing into a domestic rule, a fully-fledged and operational domestic rule. Now, simplifying tremendously, the obligation to criminalize certain international conducts is not self-executing. Uh, at least because it lacks sanctions. Uh, and this is why we need legislative proposals like the one we are discussing uh, in this panel today. Yet, the fact that a customary international obligation is not self-executing may render Article 10 insufficient to guarantee its implementation at the domestic level, but will not render Article 10 completely irrelevant. The mechanism of Rembois of Article 10, Paragraph 1, operates nevertheless, allowing the international rule to produce some effects within our domestic legal system. Uh, 
Albeit not immediately effective, customary international criminal rules circulate within the Italian legal system and must be coordinated with the other rules that compose that system. This entails a number of consequences. First of all, the application of the presumption of conformity. Domestic rules should always be interpreted, when at all possible, of course, in the way that better ensures the fulfillment of the international obligation. This applies to the rules that define the crimes, for instance, Article 600 or 601 of the Italian Criminal uh, Code should be read in the light of the international rules on slavery and trafficking in human beings. But also, this reasonment, the, the presumption of conformity, uh, also applies to the rules of the general part uh, of criminal law, when they are applied, of course, in respect of um, conducts that amount to an, inter an international crime. I'm wondering, for instance, if the Corte d'Assise d'Appello of Rome was not inspired by this presumption of conformity when it applied the domestic rules on co perpetration, Articles uh, 110, etc., of the Italian Criminal Code, in a pretty extensive manner, so to say, in the Condor case. Uh, another, um, another consequence of the application of Article 10, of the relevance of Article 10, is that the international customary obligation to prosecute certain crimes limits, will limit the discretionality of state authorities when granting pardon or commuting sentences. This happened, for instance, when the Procura Generale within the Corte d'Appello di Milano expressed its opinion against the granting of presidential pardon to Colonel Joseph Romano III, who was implicated in extremely serious crimes against international humanitarian law. That was an opinion delivered in 2013. There is a very last element I would like to highlight. Substantive rules of the special part of international criminal law might not be self-executing, but does this also apply to the rules of the general part? <laughs> Take, for instance, the rule whereby international crimes should not be subjected to the expiration of statutes of limitations, Article 29 of the statute, which is probably by now a rule of customary international law. The relevance of Article 10 of the Italian Constitution in this field, in this respect, was invoked in the Haspecter case, uh, which was decided by the Military Tribunal of Rome in 1997. The international rule <coughs> on the uh, irrelevance of statutes of limitations, per se, is self-executing, is self-sufficient. So it would if it's immediately effective, it should render Article 157 of the Italian Criminal Code unconstitutional because of the contrast with Article 10 of the Constitution insofar as this rule is applied to conducts that amount to international crimes uh, under international law. This, of course, unless we consider that the international rule runs counter of a fundamental principle of the Constitution. Is this the case? Can Article 25 of the Constitution operate as a counter limit in this case? I certainly do not have the time to explore this issue, and perhaps someone else will tackle this in another panel. But my personal perception is that the arguments that were used by the uh, Constitutional Court in the Tariko case to shake the ghost of counter limits against a new rule that could have an impact on statutes of limitation provided under Italian law. The, the reasons, the arguments were basically indeterminacy and retroactivity. Well, perhaps those arguments would not be that relevant and would not apply in respect of an international rule that makes statutory limitations irrelevant for international crimes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Anon, for her interesting uh, presentation. Now, Luigi Fofani, professor, full professor of criminal law 
at the University of Modena e Reggio Emilia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I only have uh, seven minutes for my speech. Ten, ten. Ten, okay. But I need to spend uh, 30 seconds for some preliminary thanks. First of all, thank you very much to Chantal, Florian, Maria, and all the organizers of this very interesting, fascinating, and interdisciplinary initiative. And thank you very much also to the Humboldt Stiftung. The Humboldt Stipendium was very important in my career, in my period of formation in Germany, at the beginning of this millennium. And a lot of friends and colleagues in Italy and abroad had a similar experience. But enjoying a Humboldt Stipendium means also this fantastic possibility to organize and to participate in a Humboldt College, a very stimulating occasion of uh, uh, scientific international exchange between former Humboldtiana. And now about uh, the subject of this panel. My perspective is that uh, of uh, a criminal law lawyer, of course, and uh, precisely a criminal lawyer who has no significant large experience with uh, international criminal law. Nevertheless, I would like to propose a couple of uh, very short considerations. First of all, one about the structure of the legislative projects. I am friend of an autonomous codification for the international criminal law, like the German example of the Völkerstrafgesetzbuch, for different reasons. First, a, a symbolic reason. We have to transmit to the Italian public opinion the image of a, the special high rank of this legislation. Therefore, I believe it should not be a normal <coughs> chapter inside the criminal code. So. Second, a historical reason. Italy has a large and consolidated tradition of strafrechtliche uh, Nebengesetze, of special legislation in criminal matter outside the criminal code. There is no doubt that for the domestic international criminal law, there are good reasons to confirm this historical trend of the Italian legislation. Historical trend that is also compatible with the new principle of the Riserva di Codice, Article 3b of the Italian Criminal Code. And third, a technical reason. The description of the international crimes may not be understood without the aims and the context. The aims for the crimes of genocide and the context for crimes against humanity and war crimes. Without this reference to the aims and or the context, the legislative description of these crimes is often too poor, too synthetic, too large, and too vague. For example, the description of the crime of terror, Article 39 of the Caripro Project, or of the crime of plunder, Article 33, is too synthetic and vague if compared with the national crimes of terrorism in the Italian or other European criminal codes. The description of the crimes of hostage taking, Article 26 of Caripo Project and Article 78 of the Kessler Project and also Joven and Gozzi Project, is um, too large if compared with the national provisions about the crimes of kidnapping, sequestro di persona. The legal description must always be integrated and clarified 
within the context. And the autonomous codification of the international crimes can avoid its confusion and superposition with the common crimes of the criminal code, highlighting the special character of these crimes by reason of their aims and context. Of course, the choice for an autonomous codification does not mean separation from the principles and the rules of the general part of the criminal code. On the contrary, I believe it is necessary to insert inside the domestic international criminal code a general clause with a link to the general part of a criminal code for all that is not specifically regulated in the International Criminal Court. A last consideration about a special topic, the responsibility of juridical persons, legal entities. In the CARIPRO project, if I'm not mistaken, there are no provisions regarding the responsibility of legal entities. A similar provision is contained, for example, in the Kessler project, in the Jovene project, and in the Gozzi project, Article 6. But in all these projects, it is an inverse model of responsibility if compared with the EU model or with our Italian system of legislative decree 231 of 2001. The scheme of these projects is that an international crime can be committed from natural persons availing a legal entity, and the legal entity is sanctioned with the dissolution. But from my point of view, the introduction of a domestic international criminal code is also fully compatible with the structure and what is foreseen in the legislative decree 231 of 2001. It means that a juridical person and every uh, legal entity may, may be punished with fine and the most relevant case with interdiction and dissolution when the crime is committed by a natural person in favor or in the interest of a juridical person, which has not adopted an efficient model of organization, compliant program. In my opinion, not only the introduction um, of a domestic international criminal code, but also the link between international criminal code and responsibility of legal entities is a historical challenge for our legislator. On the one hand, there is theoretical the problem of an eventual responsibility of public entities like national states, but there is no legal basis in international law, and it is also not possible for our national legislator. It would be an authentic revolution for the model 231. But on the other hand, there is the concrete uh, possibility to introduce a responsibility of legal entities for international crime in the private sector. Our colleague Danieto, for example, has presented a project for the introduction of an international crime of ecocide with responsibility of juridical persons, but I think that the introduction of a domestic international criminal code is the best way to introduce a general provision about the responsibility of multinational enterprises and every corporation that in their abroad activity in dangerous countries with conflictive situations, civil wars, etc., have not an adequate compliance program for the prevention of international crimes. And an international crime is committed in its favor or in its interest. In a recent decision of the Court of Rome, <coughs> a corporation was convicted 
because it had no adequate provision of social political risks in its compliance programs. And an employee of this corporation was uh, kidnapped and murdered in Libya during the exercise of his job. It can be a good model for a more general implementation of compliance programs for the protection of human rights and for the prevention of international crimes. To activate every corporation, and especially the great multinational enterprises for the prevention of international crimes in the countries where they exercise their activities could be a very important juridical and political instrument to preserve peace and legality all over the world. Thank you very much for your attention. I thank Luigi and personally, personally as not expert of this uh, topic, but as uh, Allgemeiner Strafsechler, personally agree totally uh, with uh, the idea of an autonome collocation of this matter in a specific legal source for the reason that Luigi very good has explained. Uh, now, uh, Professor Antonio Marchesi, full professor of international law at the University of Teramo, and also he was uh, president of the Italian section of Amnesty International. So with this both experience, both I think he <laughs> will explain. Uh, Thank you. A lot of Thank you very much. Professor Marchesi. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, um, uh, even though you have invited me to discuss what, in fact, is a rather depressing topic, that is, Italy's uh, minimalistic approach to implementation of the ICC statute uh, and implementation of international norms on the punishment of international crimes more, more in general. Um, and the results of this approach are, are very well summarized in the concept note that was prepared for this conference. Um, I will use the, the minutes that I have at my disposal uh, for, for two uh, purposes. Uh, first, to update you on uh, the most recent effort in which I was involved uh, to bring the issue simply back into the political debate and then to make a few remarks on possible ways forwards. Uh, in 2019, we agreed with the International Humanitarian Law Clinic of, uh, of Roma 3 University that they would make available a report that was in, in preparation on Italian law on international crimes as it now stands and on what would be required to implement the ICC statute. Uh, and that Amnesty International Italy, of, of which I was chair at the, at, at the time, uh, would use it to uh, sort of initiate a new lobbying effort. Uh, the report is, is very good, thanks to Giulio Bartolini, Alice Riccardi, and their, and their students. Uh, it covers complementarity, but it also covers uh, cooperation, uh, considering the, the, the flaws, the limitations of the 2012 <coughs> Uh, law and cooperation, and each section includes recommendations upon which we, upon which we did base uh, a sort of effort to renew interest for, for the topic uh, in, in political circles. circles. Uh, I'll just mention some of the main issues that are addressed in the paper. Uh, removal of a time bar in Italian law for all crimes under the statute. Uh, providing a specific offense of crimes against humanity in order to take the, the contextual element into account, a thorough revision of provisions on war crimes, and finally, the introduction of a crime of aggression. And insofar as the latter, that is, aggression, is concerned, the Italian Parliament had, and still has, in fact, on its agenda, a bill which envisages ratification of the Kampala Amendments. Uh, and our attempt was actually to take the opportunity 
uh, of the discussion of the Kampala amendments in the Foreign Affairs Committee of, uh, of the Chamber of Deputies and to try to broaden the scope of that, uh, of that discussion. Uh, the fact that the ICC was already on the Parliament's agenda, uh, albeit for very limited purposes, was an opportunity uh, and, and we wanted to take that opportunity to broaden the discussion. In the meantime, uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee has passed uh, the proposal to ratify the Kampala Amendments, uh, which however has been waiting to be discussed in the plenary since uh, early March, I believe. Uh, and at this point, personally, I'm no longer sure that it makes much sense to pursue the tactics that we tried in 2019, simply because I hope that at least uh, the 2010 Kampala amendments may be ratified without, uh, without further delay. At the same time, however, to authorize ratification of the Kampala amendments without introducing a provision criminalizing aggression uh, is, is apparently contradictory. Uh, the text uh, includes authorization of ratification a rather useless general referral, that is an ordine di esecuzione, uh, but no specific norms criminalizing aggression. And here I see analogies with what happened in 1988 with the ratification of CAT, the Convention Against Torture, which did not include the necessary specific legislation, and it took about 30 years to remedy that, uh, that mistake. Uh, coming to my short comments on the, on the points raised in the, in the concept note, for the sake of brevity, I will refer only to the main options. Uh, I too believe that the idea of a separate code of crimes against international law covering both general and, and, and the, the general and the special part is the best approach. The principle of legality obviously requires an ad hoc codification and the more practical way of doing it is probably to enact uh, separate autonomous legislation rather than to integrate the, the, the criminal code. And with regard to the general part, uh, a referral could be made to the principles in the ordinary criminal code except when ad hoc pr pr provisions are required, that is command responsibility, immunities, maybe superior orders, statute of limitations. Uh, as a side comment, let me say that uh, constitutional restraints, including the principle of, of legality, are in my experience very often referred to in, in the parliamentary debates, uh, far more than international obligations. And that is perhaps simply because MPs are very uh, likely to be more familiar with constitutional rather than with, uh, with international law. And these constitutional restraints are often overstated, uh, in my view. During the discussion on the, on, on the crime of torture, reference was all, often made to the fact that it was not possible to use the international definitions because they were not in conformity with the principle of a determis, determinacy, which I believe is, is far from convincing and simply reflected mistrust uh, for international law rather than a genuine legal concern. Uh, let me say very briefly something about possible ways forwards. Um, assuming that, I mean, the aim of this conference is, is to help achieve practical results, and not only sort of to pursue uh, legal perfection in the, in the abstract, um, I think we need to be strategic, which means First of all, understanding what has gone wrong so far, possibly, um, and where the resistance is, where the obstacles are, uh, and also uh, is where we currently stand uh, only because there was something uh, that was not acceptable in the previous drafts, or is it more realistically uh, that there was too little interest by decision makers? Uh, how much of the problem is about objections to the proposals which were tabled, and how much is it about the ICC being rather low down in the legislators' priorities? Now, if the latter is true, and I believe that at least in part it is, uh, in addition to looking at the previous drafts, uh, although I believe that the Cariplo draft is not only excellent but also rather recent, uh, the point is ways of finding, ways of triggering interest in decision makers. And that is an extremely difficult task. 
looking at the precedents, once again, implementation of obligations on torture, which I'm more familiar with, what made the difference was in the end, uh, the multiple findings of violations of Article 3 of the European Convention by the Strasbourg Court uh, for inability to punish uh, those responsible for torture in, in, in Genoa in 2001. Uh, uh, that is what, after decades of stalemate, and notwithstanding the repeated criticism by the treaty bodies, really convinced the Italian authorities to introduce a specific uh, albeit not satisfactory, uh, offensive torture. Um, so in my feeling, um, we need to sort of look for a creative strategy to force decision makers to pr play more attention to the issue and place it on their agenda. Uh, ideally, we would need to argue that Italy would be, f would be found unable, were it required to do so, to adequately prosecute certain international crimes, either for lack of a specific offense or on account of the statute of, of limitations. Um, could we use strategic litigation? Um, could we initiate c cases with the purpose of revealing uh, this sort of uh, inability? Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of the communication to the excellent communication to the ICC prosecutor that Chantal and Florian contributed to draft uh, about uh, arms exports to Yemen uh, as, as war crimes. Uh, could that be useful in this, uh, in this respect? Um, I was reading this morning about a case of a German citizen who was recently arrested in Italy uh, uh, someone who was involved in, in the Pinochet uh, regime and which Chile has asked to extradite. Um, what if uh, that was not possible on account of statute of limitations, for example? That would mean that Italy would be unable to prosecute someone who is accused of crimes against humanity. Uh, I am trying to be creative, and I'm not at all sure that the ideas that I am suggesting have any, any substance. Uh, but I think we should try to be creative at this stage. We could also try to find ways of raising issues of non-compliance with Article 117 of the Italian Constitution, or even maybe with constitutional obligations to protect fundamental rights through criminal law. Uh, these are all ideas that may not be the most effective routes, but I think this is the sort of thinking that could be useful. Um, I simply believe that if uh, we must find way, we should find ways of increasing attention if the projects uh, under discussion in this conference are to be considered at all by, uh, by decision makers. Uh, I will stop here. Uh, thank you for inviting me again, and please excuse me for talking more as an activist than as a professor of law. Thank you. Thank to Professor Marchesi for his interesting uh, uh, presentation. And now I think we have uh, one uh, uh, an online uh, participation. It's right. Professor Nicola Selvaggi, Associate Professor of Criminal Law at the University of Reggio Calabria, and uh, um, a Chief of Cabinet uh, at the uh, Italian Minister, uh, uh, <coughs> Ministry of Justice. So we can, uh, I see directly in the video, and so Professor Selvaggi, please. Thank you very much. Um, I know that I have to uh, save some time for the discussion, and and so I will try to be to be to be very very quick and to leave room for the for the debate. Um, I would like to thank first of all Professor Chantal Meloni for the invitation and the opportunity I was given to participate in such an important conference. Um, such an interesting exercise as the one we are having today. An exercise that aims to um, summarize the difficulties of uh, adapting the substantive provisions of 
the Rome Statute to domestic law, while at the same time recalling the underlying reasons uh, thereof. Um, I have to, um, to, to, to highlight that given my current position of, of deputy head of cabinet at the Ministry of Justice, I will um, report only my personal opinion and not those of the Ministry of Justice, maybe some flavor um, of, of, uh, of the, 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 the current attitude of the, of the Ministry of Justice will maybe uh, <clears throat> come, come out um, uh, from, the, from the round table of, of, of Saturday. Um, it is certainly not an opinion, however, that we uh, look at our legislation, uh, uh, we, are, we are still uh, far from, from a real coverage, uh, if, if we can call it that, I would say a full implementation of all aspects relating to substantive international criminal law. Uh, I cannot go uh, beyond a very brief sketch since a lot has been said so far. Suffice it to recall that domestic criminal law uh, lack the contextual elements uh, um, which define the supranational dimension of, of, of international crimes and, of course, are the reference for the construction of the uh, objective element, uh, mens rea and circumstances. And moreover, if for some cases of crimes against humanity, it is possible to find a, uh, a correspondence uh, with, with, uh, with common um, criminal hypotheses, um, for other cases, the domestic uh, discipline is only, only, only partial and may require more complete uh, definitions. Um, <clears throat> colleagues um, who have, have spoken earlier have already mentioned the, the attempts that have uh, followed one another without um, ever having been followed up. Uh, at least, uh, at least so far, I only would like to mention, among others, the, the project uh, developed by the by um, um, a working group that operated within the framework of a research project uh, promoted by the Association of Criminal Law Professors. I will, I will make some reference to to the latter. All these initiatives. Uh, um, Mm, it has been said already, face some very general issues. Once uh, the so-called non-incorporation or zero solution option has been excluded, it is a question of choosing between a complete and a combined or modified incorporation. And as far as forms of combinations are concerned, it is a question of evaluating the path to be followed between inserting a specific title in the penal code or um, drafting a bill with an, um, an autonomous normative uh, body, which is characterized uh, uh, by internal systematic uh, nature. The latter possibilities, for example, the one taken into consideration by the bill uh, Kessler, where uh, there is no uh, lack of, of interventions on code in force, but on the whole, as is known, the aim is to include the provisions in, in a sort of, of international uh, penal code with, with provisions of a general nature um, as well. Other exercises, such as um, the one developed by the working group that I have mentioned before of the Criminal Law Professors Association, um, seems to look more uh, favorably at the um, idea of, de of developing an autonomous title uh, or section in the criminal code. And this uh, would be uh, also in order to safeguard uh, the function of unification and rationalization of the, of the criminal code uh, itself. Um, <clears throat> well, analyzing the second option in more detail, uh, um, a special part of the Italian criminal code could be uh, enriched through the introduction of an autonomous section, which uh, would be valid as an implementation of, of the Rome uh, statute. Um, 
there would be, of course, in this perspective, uh, questions uh, um, concerning the exact uh, uh, setting or lo location of this set of criminal provisions within the normative environment, or better saying, within the criminal code. Uh, and, and of course, this would be, uh, and this question would be, would be, um, uh, let's say, uh, linked to uh, to uh, to the uh, traditional uh, structure of of the special uh, uh, part of of the criminal code, uh, which is as known characterized. Uh, by the so-called descending progression based on the uh, pivotal role of, 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 uh, of, the, of the state. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, of course, there are, um, there are um, good reasons to go autonomous. Uh, um, these reasons uh, uh, have been already um, underlined and highlighted by Professor uh, Fofani, there are um, political, um, symbolic, and historical, and, and, and tactical ones. And I would not go uh, <clears throat> further as they have been already sketched out uh, by, by Luigi Fofani. Now, um, in in, in the time left, I, I would just uh, limit myself uh, um, after having sketched out the issue of incorporation um, in, in, in the, the criminal code uh, or uh, the, the path of, of an autonomous uh, uh, set of, of, of provisions uh, to recalling uh, in the perspective that we are examining some questions which uh, pertain instead to the, let's say, general discipline of responsibility. Um, our first question concerns liability according to Article 28 of, of the statute, uh, um, which is a model of liability that, that has to be evaluated, taking into account the already significant presence of general clauses uh, of responsibility in the Italian uh, criminal code, uh, such as those of the Article 40 and, and Article 110, and above all their application uh, by, by the case law. And in particular, um, um, a still open problem, it seems to me, lies in the fact that Article 28 seems to conceive the failure to adopt measures to prevent and repress crime as equivalent. And the same can be said for the, for the failure to submit the matter to the competent uh, authorities for investigation and prosecution. Another issue is that of, of finding a legal avenue to give relevance to those cases in which someone um, in a prominent position has tolerated uh, other peasants' criminal uh, con conduct. Um, a final and quick remark on corporate uh, uh, criminal liability or quasi-criminal liability. Um, one, um, uh, one, one, one issue, uh, one topic uh, um, is, is, is uh, linked to, to the subjective scope of application of the degree 230-31, as, as um, uh, attention was as known paid by the Italian legislator uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the possibility for, for the following subjects to fall within, uh, within the scope of application of, of the legislative degree. And uh, the uh, and the and and and, and the, 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 the the current provisions as as, as known uh, provide for an exclusion of state and and its bodies and economic public entities and those carrying out uh, um, known in entrepreneurial activities activities uh, and 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 also political parties and, and trade unions so. Uh, on, on one hand, uh, um, um, let's say a, a first milestone could, could, uh, could uh, um, come through the understanding uh, 
of whether uh, the scope, the, the, the subjective scope of, of, of application of the legislative degree uh, should, be, um, should be extended. Um, another, um, another remark, and this is the, 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 the real uh, final and conclusive one, is, is triggered by, by uh, um, um, an observation made by Professor Fofani. So it's really in the wake of, of Luigi Fofani uh, uh, from this perspective, and it concerns the nature of, of liability. Um, since uh, uh, I don't have to go through the, the discussion on, on the nature of liability as provided for by the legislative degree, but it is true that uh, considering the seriousness of the predicate crime in this, in this, uh, in this uh, case, uh, um, maybe, maybe extending liability of legal persons also to international crimes, those crimes pr provided for by the statute of Rome would be uh, a chance uh, that would trigger also uh, again the discussion on uh, introducing uh, finally a proper and genuine form of criminal liability of legal entities. Thank you very much. I think I thank uh, Professor Selvaggi uh, for his uh, presentation concerning also the important questions uh, about uh, the dogmatic schwerpunkte of the issue that uh, for our criminal lawyer uh, are very very important of course we are perfect in time. We have time, I think, for the discussion. Chantal, how many time, uh, how much time uh, uh, for each uh, intervention? Five minutes. Five minutes. We are okay. 15 minutes today, so just be short. So you okay. <laughs> I say it here so that also those online uh, can hear. Of course, the debate is open here, but also for those who are following on Zoom. So I see already there is someone asking. And maybe when someone asks uh, in the chat, Maria, you can read it loud. And Okay. Okay, uh, so Antonio Gil is asking whether, um, how does Europe view the concept of universal criminal jurisdiction, such as is implemented in Germany, Switzerland, and the USA, for example? Who wants to answer, Who answer this question? <laughs> Can, uh, yeah. So, uh, just a short question for Professor Annoni. Um, uh, you said before that, uh, that Article 10 of the Italian Constitution should allow a criminal court to disapply national domestic rules on limitation if they are incompatible with an international uh, obligation to prosecute some international crimes. Um, without any, uh, any time limit. So um, I wonder how this uh, could be reconciled with the principles set by the Italian Constitutional Court in the Torico case. So you mentioned that there must be a difference, but uh, I, would like to, to, uh, I would like some more elaboration on this concept. Thank you.
other interventions. Thank you, Giulio Bartolini, Roma Terra University. Uh, I have one point in dealing with uh, the ways in which you can uh, approach any potential uh, changes in this regard. Uh, you've seen the different solution between a separate code or a modification in the current criminal code. I wonder what could be the relationship with the military justice, uh, because in particular, these, um, of course, a series of uh, these international crimes uh, could, uh, are currently dealt by military judge, uh, judges uh, under the, the, the wartime criminal code, and I wonder from your uh, ideas what could be the best solution to integrate uh, the different um, uh, judicial system in this potential reform, uh, also take into account the scope of application of the dif of the ratione per persone for prosecution and uh, the, the, the existing challenging challenges in uh, addressing uh, such, uh, such situation, particularly with regard both for persons responsible for crimes, being them uh, Italian citizens, uh, members of the armed forces, or foreigners, what could be the best solution in any potential lawmaking uh, effort that we, we hope could be adopted? It's all. And so, first uh, question. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Well, actually, I, I don't think that the Italian judges could disapply the Italian rule on statute of limitation in order to enforce the international one. Uh, but I think that the Italian rules are unconstitutional insofar as they are applied to international crimes. The only way to make sure that this contrast is uh, diluted is resorting to the Constitutional Court. So that is the uh, way forward in my mind. I'm also aware that there could be, uh, there are several issues, issues at stake that should be considered. One is counter limits, the possible of uh, Article 25, as I was mentioning. And the other problem is that we will end up fragmentating the uh, general part of our criminal code that way, because we would say the rule on statute of limitation applies to kidnapping when it's just kidnapping, but when kidnapping is enforced, disappearance disguised, then the rule of statute of limitation does not apply anymore. So uh, I don't know how the constitutional court could end up deciding this issue, but my perception is that it, the court would have to take into consideration the customary international rule and balancing it somehow. Thank you. Just on the question about Europe, first of all, who is Europe? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> if Europe is the European Union, I don't think there is a specific opinion, but uh, maybe some colleagues may contradict uh, me. Uh, I am not aware, I mean, but, uh, and I think that every state in Europe has a different opinion about, uh, about uh, universal jurisdiction, so um, I don't think it is possible to identify a European view of universal uh, jurisdiction. <clears throat> Last question. Can I just, just add something on what um, Professor Annoni was saying? I, I fully agree with her answer. Excuse me. <laughs> um, it, it, a similar problem can be raised with, with the issue of torture, notwithstanding the fact that there is now a, a, an offense of torture because that offense does not carry uh, an extended sort of time, uh, it's the, the ordinary time limits apply. So should, should torture not be punished uh, in a specific case as a result of, of the time bar, as a statute of limitations? 
um, in violation or in presumable violation of obligations uh, set out in, in, in human rights conventions to which Italy is, is, uh, is a party, uh, that could raise issues under Article 117 of the, of the Constitution. Um, because uh, uh, in, 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 in the part in which it still allows impunity on account of the statute of limitations, that law would not be in conformity with Italy's international obligations. It's once again a bit creative, but it is, it is something that has been, uh, that has been raised. Uh, so, I mean, it ha it's an analogy, uh, with, it refers to torture, not necessarily to torture as an international crime, and it's provided for in, in treaties rather than in customary law, uh, but there is some, some, some analogy. And it wouldn't be, uh, I, I read uh, something written in the, in the chat, uh, it's, uh, it, it's not, uh, I mean, this, this wouldn't be a, a monist approach, it would be simply applying an article of the Italian Constitution. question of Professor Bertolini on uh, uh, how to um, intervene in the competences of military courts and uh, what would be the solution and uh, so in integrating war crimes into a single uh, code uh, of international crimes am I interpreting correctly what your question so what would uh, how one should intervene in the uh, issue of uh, uh, the, the coordinating the different uh, legal, uh, uh, the different laws and different codes and, uh, and also how to decide about the competencies of the military courts or ordinary courts. <clears throat> I have not reflected on this issue, so I'm not uh, able to give my, my opinion. More a procedural, procedural question. We we need perhaps uh, uh, an expert in uh, criminal procedural law about uh, this topic. Perhaps, perhaps in the following uh, of the works uh, can. Uh, Just a second, because. For as to the second part of your answer, so the possibility that a question of constitutionality is raised before the Constitutional Court to challenge the constitutionality of the current rules on statute of limitation because they are incompatible with the, with the international uh, obligations on statute of limitation. Uh, we have been faced, uh, I think, two years ago or three years ago with a similar, with a similar case, in fact, and it was a case, and it was a case involving um, a sexual crime uh, committed by a priest, by the way, uh, um, towards a, a young boy, and uh, the crime, it, and um, and um, and the limitation time has already expired. And uh, the preceding court uh, asked whether uh, the provision on the statute of limitation was compatible with Article 117 of the Italian Constitution, um, referring to uh, a framework decision on the protection of the victim in criminal proceedings, I, uh, I, uh, I remember more or less, and um, um, stating that, uh, well, um, it was not provided in that, in that framework decision that there shouldn't be any, st any, any limitation time, but it, it was provided that the limitation rules must be such as to allow 
um, a prosecution in time, especially when these crimes uh, are committed against minors. So they, ha they should have the time to reach the uh, adulthood and then to denounce the crime and then to report the crime and then etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we were faced with this dilemma whether or not to apply Article 117, but then we stopped short, in fact, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of declaring the law unconstitutional for, uh, for several reasons, in fact. One of the reasons was the, 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 the particular weight of the principle of legality and the need for a defendant to foresee the possible application, which, which, which works, which has been considered to work as a counter limits to the binding force of international obligations. So I think, I think both ways, the, the, or both solutions, the direct disapplication by ordinary courts and the intervention of the constitutional court uh, are problematic in a way in this respect, precisely uh, based on the principle set set in, uh, in the Tariqa judgments by the constitutional courts itself. So it's not an easy, an easy path, I think. Oh. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, th there are perhaps some differences, though, in this, in this case, because as you said, the problem where there was probably foreseeability. I wonder whether we have the same problem with the, a rule, an international rule that says no statutes of limitation at all for international crimes. Um, it's a bit like with the Taiko case. In the Taiko case, also the court somehow said uh, Article 25 could come into consideration, but there was an issue of determinacy of the EU law uh, that had an impact on the statutes of limitation. There was an issue of retroactivity. And I wonder whether these same arguments could be used against the rule of customary international law that is a long-standing rule of customary international law and it is very clear-cut, determined, uh, with no exceptions, basically. So, we, we can conclude uh, for this morning our work. Thank you at all. Perhaps. Just one, just one uh, word on the statute of limitation. There are two conventions on the statute of limitation that Italy has not ratified. Now, it would be sufficient to ratify them because uh, a rule that declares the crimes are not subject to statute of limitation is self-executing. You don't need to, to have internal legislation. This, the, the order of execution will be, will be sufficient, but, but you have to ratify it. There is one of the Council of Europe and one of the United Nations, and they are large enough to cover any international crime, because it, it starts with the crime committed in the Nazi period, but it goes to other crimes against humanity, to whatever. I mean, so you, the Geneva Conventions and everything. So, in fact, it will be, it will be absolutely sufficient. So the legislature could simply, uh, could simply accept the convention, ratify the convention, that would be resolve the problem totally. Okay. Just 30 seconds. Do you hear me? Yeah. I'm wondering uh, why you are talking about a state of limitations uh, in a situation in which, as it is in Italy, we didn't have the subject matter of the problem. We didn't have international crimes, but for crimes which are, as offense definitions, corresponding to the underlying offenses of international crimes.
But you have, we do have a huge problem now. We didn't have the subject matter. We didn't have a, a, a code, or you didn't have a definition of crimes against humanity. So the problem of stated of limitations is moot, paradoxically. Don't you think so? I would just say that it is not totally true that we don't have international crimes. There are, the, we, we don't have a complete code on international crimes, but there are international crimes in the uh, Italian uh, legislation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but anyway, of course, the, the problem of statute of limitation would become uh, central in the adoption of a code of international crimes. <clears throat> So it's all. Thank you all, especially to the participants of this workshop, of this panel. And uh, we begin uh, at 2 o'clock uh, in this afternoon.